everybody, and welcome to another episode of Resiliency Radio with Dr. Jill. Today, I have a special guest and longtime friend, Dr. Kara Fitzgerald. I will introduce her in just a moment, but as you well know, if you've been a fan or listener to the podcast, you can find all of our episodes on iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube, wherever you listen or watch podcasts. If you do like this podcast, please share with a friend or leave a review. That really helps us reach more people. And uh, just love having you as an audience. So as always, you can leave your comments or feedback about future episodes or topics that you want to hear. So today we are going to talk about aging in reverse. You might think this is science fiction, but now we have so much science to back up not only testing and determining what is our biological age, but also the uh, practical interventions, some very, very practical things we're going to dive into. What can you actually do based on the science? And what I love about Dr. Fitzgerald is she is all about the science and the research. We're going to nerd out today, so stay tuned and hang on. Let me just introduce her and we'll jump right in. Dr. Kara Fitzgerald received her Doctor of Naturopathic Medicine degree at the National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon. Um, She completed the first consul on naturopathic pathic medicine accredited postdoctorate position in nutritional biochemistry and laboratory science at Metametrics Clinical Laboratory. Now, you and I both know that was years ago, right? I remember your first lab book, which is one of your first or second publications. That was all those case studies, Karen. You did such a great job because way back in Thank the you. beginning of functional medicine, all of us were trying to pave a new road and you published these case studies. It was called, well, you were part of the case studies in integrative and functional medicine as a contributing author, author and then the lab evaluations for integrative and functional medicine. Both of those were on my bookshelves in the beginning. So as I said, we've known each other a long time and we had such a great respect. You published a lot of different things. You've been a research clinician for the Institute of Therapeutic Discovery. You've been on faculty for IFM. And I could go on and on. Your website is drkarafitzgerald.com. And at the end and in the show notes, we'll leave all the links to where to find you. But welcome to the show. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, it's going way back. I appreciate the shout out for that case studies book. I mean, it really, it was a, it was a pretty intense journey, but it was so awesome to write it, write down what we do, you know, really what, how do you, how do we practice this, this systems medicine called functional medicine? And, and so, yeah, I still appreciate it, even though now it's, it's over 10 years old. I do too. Quite a while ago. So relevant because like you said, the, the things that you and I in practice, we've been doing it so long, it starts to come natural. But when someone's first learning, there's no textbook for what we do. As I'm even training in my clinic nurse practitioners, oftentimes she's like, well, where do I find this information? I'm like, well, I can tell you, but I don't know that there's a reference, you know, in a textbook about how to exactly approach. And of course, we are all creating more and more pathways and case studies. And I think now 10, 20 years later, there's so much more out there, but still it's really interesting when like someone would observe you in clinical practice or observe me because it's not um there's not a uh you know 20 textbooks out there that document it so i really really do appreciate that well first of all let's start out with just a little bit of story about dr kara how did you get into functional medicine had you always wanted to be a doctor tell us more about your journey into where you're at now um I knew that I was going, so I was, I was thinking about medicine, actually conventional MD, and I was thinking about psychology, um, and take these together, you know, as I was getting ready for my next, um, you know, move my do, you know, doing my, my various graduate entrance exams, I was sitting with it. I was working in a health food store at the time in the supplement section. Um, and I also developed chronic fatigue. So I had a lot, a lot going on. I I was really kind of burning the candle at both ends and ended up developing kind of a classic chronic fatigue, but all of these, these balls were happening in my life. I, my landlady at the time sent me to her physician who turned out to be a naturopathic doctor. So I went to, so I had fatigue. I went to the, I went to all sorts of standard, um, medical doctors. One guy was sophisticated enough to actually prescribe B vitamins. I remember that being really interesting to me right. to get a, a B vitamins in a, in a medical bottle, um, you know, in that classic mm-hmm. kind of orange bottle. Um, but nothing got me better and they didn't find anything. So I, so she sent me to her doctor who turned out to be a naturopathic physician and he got me better, you know, really quickly and pretty simply with some basic botanicals. He didn't, he didn't strong arm me with diet. Like I was young at the time and I don't know how much I would have done, but he made some suggestions to improve it. Um, 
gave me some CoQ10, gave me, um, yeah, a, a handful of combination botanicals. And, you know, before long, I was, I was absolutely better. And I was pretty blown away by that. So that experience with my first naturopath, being in a health food store and being exposed to supplements, I, I found myself getting excited about the mechanisms. You know, we would get white papers all the time. I remember Udo, Udo Erasmus had a, there was a popular book, Fats That Heal, Fats That Kill. And it was really introducing me to, um, you, you remember the book. It was yes, super it was famous. It was a long time ago, but it was famous. You know, just learning about omega-3 fatty acids and eicosanoids and all of this. And I was really excited about it. And that, um, that really, that informed my decision. You know, when it came time to decide on medical schools, it was, it just made sense for me to become a naturopathic physician, you know, as I just did my research. And um, I, my training was extraordinary. You know, it was just, all of it was inspirational and satisfying. I did have a penchant for biochemistry. I was in the Pacific Northwest. I was able to um, see Jeff Bland lecture routinely. He was lecturing a, a lot at that time in the specifically in the Pacific Northwest. And I ended up getting a postdoc position in a, la in a lab. Um, as you know, that's probably around the time that we met when I was there um, under the direction of Richard Lord, who's a, you know, really highly regarded nutritional biochemist. And it was just, it was just like a, a dream after dream after dream come true. Um, and I started to speak actually. So I had, I had opportunities to do real heavy, heavy drill down into the research, writing laboratory evaluations in um, integrative and functional medicine, as you mentioned. So the, our laboratory textbook was a huge part of my postdoctorate work. And then after that was the case studies book and the case studies book. Um, since we were writing in the functional medicine model, we were using the matrix timeline, et cetera, since we were using actually matrix antecedents, trigger, triggers and mediators at the time, that's what they had. That, that, that was right. the, the tool they hadn't, um, brought right. the timeline out. Um, David Jones, who was the chief medical officer and, you know, and the co-founder of IFM started to mentor me and he didn't know who I was. I mean, I was just a young upstart at the time yeah. writing the book. But he wanted to keep an eye on this person who was going to be publishing something using the functional medicine structure. And it was this incredible, again, I just consider myself so blessed to have these weekly meetings, it, you know, week in and week out with, with David Jones. And we would talk a little bit about what I was doing in the book. And really, mostly he would just, I don't know, give me sort of this like Zen yeah. um you know, transmission of information in functional medicine. And it was just extraordinary. And at the end of that, he asked me to join the faculty at IFM. So that was, I think that was my proving ground, but what a, you know, what a blessed career to, you know, just really start in that, that juicy way that felt, you know, designed beyond anything I could have, you know, beyond my wildest dreams, really. Right. I love it. And yet in that, I see like your brilliance is that curiosity that is a mark of genius that, that I want to know more what's the mechanism, what's the, and one thing I love about what you've brought to our field is I remember so well that lab textbook. Once again, there's nothing, even on my shelves now, there's still nothing out there like that. I yeah. love to dive in and look at the pathways and figure out what the testing might show. And really at the core, those of us who really, really love functional medicine, we have to love biochemistry because it's all about yeah. going back to what we were taught peripherally in medical school, but most of us forgot and never really used that. And now we're going yeah. back to really, really diving in. And I think those of us like you and I who really, really love what we do, it's we get fascinated by these pathways, right? Yes. I mean, they have so much more meaning when you look yeah. at them through the lens of functional medicine, through, you know, nutrition, it's right. just, they, be they become so much more meaningful yeah. than just, you know, memorizing pathways because you have to spit it right. out on your exam. Yeah. <laughs> And I always have such a, 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 a just a deep respect for naturopathic medicine because you have paved the way with basically nutritional biochemistry in your field compared to us allopathic nutrition poor physicians who really have very little training. Literally, I'm sure you know this, Kara, but my training in medical school was about six weeks of TPN, which is IV nutrition after surgery. And that was almost it. And so everything else has been much, much on my own and any allopathic doctor, hopefully now they're starting to incorporate a little bit more, but it's amazing how little nutrition the average doctor is, it understands. So I know it's thanks. astonishing. I, and I do think the field is changing. I mean, I think that it's expanding, but yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely mind blowing that that it was right. You know, not relevant. important, not relevant. <laughs> right. So let's talk about this new thing. First of all, for those who aren't aware, I want to kind of pave the groundwork. What is this? But you have a new article, and you have lots of stuff you've published or re, you know on your website and podcasts and things about. Uh, studies and information using epigenetic modeling for biological clocks. Now, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. And just to kind of bridge it with my background, I think, you know, being in an early sort of omics lab where we, we were doing these broad investigations into fatty acids and amino acids and organic acids, that I think it was a good foundation for me to, you know, eventually in my career, really want to do this deep dive into epigenetics mm-hmm. um, and just make it possible for me to kind of think about it. So epi above genetics are genes. And this is really studying what turns ge- the, the biochemical marks that influence what genes are on and what genes are off, you know, and just a little bit of background is we thought that we were going to have the Rosetta Stone for all chronic disease, all diseases when we mapped the genome out in the early 2000s. We thought that would be our answer. And it turned out that it wasn't, of course, right? Our genes aren't our destiny at all. And that really leapfrogged us into the era of epigenetics. What influences what genes are on and off? And that's the environment. That's our, there is a heritable portion that we can talk about, but really by and large, it's our choices day in and day out, what we're eating, what we're doing, what we're you know saying and being and breathing and like all of this interconnection experience of, of you know, being in the environment or the exposome, that's what dictates whether, you know, we we age well and live long, or we succumb to the plethora of chronic diseases. Um, and so this is the field of epigenetics, and it's just getting bigger and bolder and brighter all of the time. We can really look at gene expression. Um, and I i mean, do you want me to give you a little background on how I got into it? <laughs> Should I? Yeah. Um, so it was probably around 2013, 14, 15 that the that the papers on um, epigenetics were just really kind of crossing my desk. And at that time, the bulk of the research was on cancer and still a lot of it is because cancer very efficiently, you know, takes over gene expression from us. The tumor microenvironment will turn genes on that it wants on for survival and turn genes off that it wants off. Very predictably, very reliably, we can test reliably for cancer by looking at these different patterns of epigenetic um, marks. I mean, it's just really powerful, really predictive. Uh, So I, it's funny, I, you know, I, I was in clinic practice at the time. I think I had a journal club. I was I was, I found myself, this is ironic. It's so ironic of like, you know, oh God, you know, I need to do this. I knew that it was important, but I was a little bit reluctant to do the drill down and the complete sort of rebuilding of my brain to dive into it and understand it. If believe it or not, there was a little bit of reluctance from this person who's so eager for mechanisms. I think these 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 papers were just were in a language just sufficiently different yeah. from where I had been so deeply trained. Even though it was an extension from where I came, I I just I remember that little that little bit of inertia that I experienced. Sometimes I wonder if it's because I knew that at some level, I knew it was going to completely change my career. Say, and I it's going like, to, yeah, like hijack <laughs> everything. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's going to just like take me over. Um, so, but as I, as I, as I really d- dug into the science, it became the, the overarching question for me was, what are we doing in functional medicine? There's no, there was no doubt in my mind that we were changing gene expression. Was it all good? Yes. What I mean was, yes. is, was there a possibility that we might be with our, with our heavy focus on methylation, with our heavy reliance on methyl donors and so forth, could we be doing something we want, we don't want to do yeah. because we're not, you know, we haven't had these tools to look that carefully yet. Right. So it was, it was, potent enough for for me to decide, you know, with my strong nutrition team here that we we could design a diet and lifestyle program. And it started just as a diet. We, there's no doubt methyl donors are important, B12, folate, choline, betaine, et cetera. We need to be bathed in them. And and as we get older, we need more. Mm -hmm. There's some suggestion that when we take them in isolation, so as vitamins, there could, there could be in certain situations that I, that I talk about in the book that we can talk about more that you, that we want to be a little bit more nuanced or careful Mm -hmm. diet, however, is 
all beneficial. There's some neutral papers, but really by and large, eating loads of greens, never a bad thing. You know, eating some liver, eat, having eggs, like by and large, consuming lots of methyl donors in a diet is nothing but beneficial. So that was our first piece of information. Let's build this really methyl donor dense diet. And then the second really kind of cool understanding from the literature was that these beautiful polyphenol compounds that we use every day, day in and day out, all of us, we know they're healthy. They've been, they have, they have, you know, long time use histories in traditional medicine around the world. Things like green tea, like curcumin and turmeric, like uh, resveratrol, like luteolin, you know, on and on quercetin. Mm -hmm. These guys seem to influence DNA methylation potently, but not by moving, not by making methyl donors in the methylation cycle, not by producing SAMe, but by directing how methylation is happening on the genome. And most of the research at the time of, of my first read in this was in um, cell studies. And it, there were some in animals. Sulforaphane actually was a really cool one. But, all, but these polyphenols, these phytochemicals uh, had very important roles to play. And, and, um, Plus, we, you know, we know that they're anti-inflammatory, that they're anti-cancer, that they're antioxidant, and on and on. Um, and so we we wanted to combine the dietary pattern with these two components and then have it be, you know, low, uh, lower keto leaning. We had good fats in it. You know, we just layered everything into it that we knew would be smart. And then we looked at... Um, the literature on exercise, on sleep, on meditation and so forth. And we saw that all of them really act similarly when we look at it, gene expression, when we look at epigenetics and, you know, DNA methylation in particular, all of them behave like food, you know, like kale, <laughs> these like they, this, they all can sh help shape gene expression in this optimal way. So we put together our diet and lifestyle program. It was very exciting. And then we started to use it here in clinic, um, we wanted to research it immediately, but at the time of development, there were no epigenetic tests like we have available now right. at all, it, you know, outside of the research setting. And so it was, you know, we were blessed with a, with an like unrestricted plan. In the beginning, right. And then after that, you got to. Yes. Then we got to research it. Yeah. So we started to use it here in our practice all the time and we saw great outcomes with it. We saw like homocysteine drop. So a classic marker yeah. of methylation. We saw that we could change it with this diet and lifestyle intervention. We saw that we could move drop inflammation. We caught, saw people would feel better. So we, we, it, we, we saw that it was providing benefit to our patients, but are we actually changing gene expression? Are we changing epigenetics, which is our hypothesis. This is mm -hmm. what we think we're doing. We released it in a white paper, actually, um, you know, just made it available to you guys, to our colleagues. Um, and is that on your website? Idea. Just so it's that not, it's well, okay. now it's the book. So now you can get Perfect. younger you and, and the, and the book is much more is, is an, okay. an evolved conversation, but back in the day, as you know, yes, we had the, we had our, our white paper that we released. Perfect. Um, if you're listening, stay tuned. We'll have links to that younger you. I just want to make sure everybody who's listening, like, where can we get this information? Yes. It's cool. in your book. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And it, and the book is plain language. It's easy to read. Um, so we used it here, but we wanted to research it. And then it was just, you know, sort of, again, this, um, you know, this just really cool, uh, you know, turn of events where we were given an unrestricted grant to study this by um, Metagenic. So I was I was friends with the CEO, the then CEO, Brent Eck, and he and I were talking about, you know, the power of methyl donors in the era of being able to see gene expression. And um, I remember very vividly, Jill, we were sitting on the floor at the IFM conference when it was in San Diego at the annual conference. We were sitting on the floor out by the registration, <laughs> you know, just kind of very humbly, just deep in conversation right, right. on this. And he, you know, and he offered um, to, to to let us embark in researching it. At the time, I was like, well, geez, maybe it'll be $10,000, you know, right. six figures later, uh -huh. we, we, we did it. Um, so our when we embarked on this, biological age was reversing biological age was not thought possible. So right. we started our IRB. We started the research back in 2017. We launched our study. Our study ran through 20, 2018 and 2019. At that time, 
biological age reversal was really believed not to be possible. In fact, the guy who developed really arguably the most important, who started this whole biological age conversation, who developed the first clock, Steve Horvath, then out of UCLA. Now he's at Altos Lab. Actually, I think he's still at both, but Altos, you know, the Jeff Bezos Lab. Um, he developed the first clock. Yeah, he was, but he's on record saying many times that he did not think that we could reverse biological age as measured by, you know, DNA methylation patterns. Um, when we were in our study, so we were midway into our study, the first publication came out. There actually there were two, one looking at vitamin, low vitamin D in obese African-Americans when they repleted vitamin T levels, biological age reverse. So they had the biological age measurement and they were able to turn it back by almost two years over 16 week study, I think. And then there was the trim study, which was a year long study using growth hormone, DHEA, uh, vitamin D. Uh, metformin. And that intervention, which Steve Horvath, the clock developer, was was a was an author on, uh, turned back biological age by over two and a half years. So when we were in our, I mean, I remember when that came out, it was such a huge deal. You know, I was paying very careful attention to epigenetics at the time. And that study came out and it was like time sort of stood still in the yeah, scientific. Like, okay, it's it. possible. <laughs> yeah, it was a big deal. Yeah. So we knew we had the tool, we we knew we had the information, we measured the DNA methylome um, to look. And so, you know, that was one of our first things that we wanted to look at. We're actually still mining our data, but, um, you know, I again, I remember the day that our biostatistician, you know, told me conclusively that we were that as compared to controls, our, our study subjects got over three years younger. Like it was, wow. it was big. Yeah, it was really, so it, was a, it was a big moment. Hey everybody, I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you wanna get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. In Younger You, you outline this, and we don't have to go into all that, but give us just a little bit of a glimpse of what is this? You talked about diet. What are kind of core principles of diet? And then what would you say are the top three, four, five things, maybe sleep, maybe that really, really do move the needle? What are What's kind of the outline of someone who's oh, out there? Such a, yeah, it's such a good question. So I think... You know, I think we want every fork full of food should be packed with epinutrients, period. Like we sh we should always be eating methyl donors and these and what we call methylation adaptogens. These those polyphenols I mentioned earlier, or phytochemicals okay. like we all that information taken together is incredibly important. And I, I believe that we want that information in also, you know, exposed to good fats. We mm -hmm. don't want it laden with sugar. Yeah. We want to minimize chemicals. Our study wasn't, we didn't require organic. Um, otherwise we would have had to provide food and, yeah. and we didn't have the income for that. So that's, it's, I'm glad that we didn't, because I think that's important information that you can do it if you can't afford organic, but we want to minimize the chemicals, the exposures. We want good fat. We don't want sugar. We don't want a lot of, um, you know, a lot of foods that are going to just kick in high glycemic cycling. Um, so it was keto leaning. I mean, it just has all the hallmarks. It was anti-inflammatory, hypoallergenic, all of the hallmarks of a good solid dietary eating pattern, probably more strict than all of us need to be all of the time, but it was only an eight week intervention. Some people okay. are like, Oh my God, I can't do this forever. And, and like, oh, well, indeed, you, so to. you can make change in eight weeks. So for example, yeah. like, likely gluten-free, dairy-free, mostly yeah. sugar, free um and yep. refined yep. carbohydrate free and then yep. uh, fat wise are you giving them fish oil are you doing like no canola no processed seed oils is there any specifics on fat we 
we gave them, we wanted them to get the specifics were olive oil. You know, mm -hmm. you could do a little bit, some coconut oil if you, if you were inclined. Um, we wanted them to eat fatty fish. That was a, that was a, a routine requirement. Um, so we, we added fats in primarily perfect. that we wanted them to consume. Yeah. Perfect. perfect. And then, yeah, that's a, go ahead. No, I was going to say, yeah, you got it. You know, you know, those, those dietary yeah. principles are really yeah, the things that are universal and plants yeah. are part of that, right? Like I'm all, I use all spectrum of diets, but at the core, we must have these phytonutrients to influence our genome. So what yeah. about, was there any criteria for hours of sleep or activity or um, meditation or any sort yeah. of things that were required? Yeah. Yeah. And then let's circle back. And I want to just sort of give you my thoughts on what I think was the heavy lift or the multiple things that were. So we wanted people to move um, five days a week. So we, they needed to engage in exercise for at least a half an hour, at least five days a week with a perceived exertion of 60 to 80 percent of their maximum. So whatever they thought was 60 mm percent -hmm. and they thought. And it's interesting because that's an accurate tool. You know, that's actually people tend to know what a 60% is for them. So that, so we, we, we specifically kept it simple and used that and they could do okay. whatever they wanted to, whatever made them happy. Um, so 60% may you, you can still talk, you can still carry on a conversation. So maybe you're walking, you're walking with your friends, you know, or you're on the phone, um, 80%, you're still able to talk, but you're breathing heavier, you're perspiring and so forth. So that was the, that was the, uh, criterion there. Um, now we can, I, you know, in the book, I write about uh, a little more involved exercise pattern and high intensity Perfect. and resistance training and all of that. Those things are important, yeah. but this is the fundamental entry into, uh, lifestyle change. So let's keep it simple. Let's do something that you love to do. In fact, do whatever you want to do as long as you hit these targets. Um, when I love meditation, that so often people are overwhelmed and so they're like, they don't do it right. So I just love, I just want to pause there and say, this is doable, right? Like you made it to be, yeah. to do this and then we can figure yes. out details, but that was really, yes, just join the conversation, you know, so let's start the party. Let's keep it simple. Yeah. My mom is a gardener. That's her thing. And she walks around her block. You know, she lives in a really nice neighborhood and she, they've got great sidewalks and that's her thing. Um, I love riding my bike and talking on the phone. I can get a good workout uh -huh. and still like catch up with my girlfriends or sometimes even it. attend a meeting, you know, right, but right. yeah, whatever works for us. Um, Sleep, sleep is essential. I mean, the data on sleep in humans and in animals at the time, it was mostly in animals, but we could see that insomnia damages gene expression. It damages uh, uh, DNA methylation on, you know, of neurons of gene expression associated with neuronal development, like immediately, you know, one, one poor night of sleep deprivation is, has been shown damaging. Now we can see in humans, that not sleeping well is a pro-aging phenomenon. No great surprise there that you are accelerating your aging. And then of course you're at risk when you're not sleeping for all the chronic diseases of aging, which are all associated with accelerated aging. So sleeping is essential. Um, we wanted people to get at least seven hours. Uh, and to that end, part of our program required our participants to meet with a nutritionist once a week. Um, and we would ask them, you know, about their quality of sleep and if they were and brainstorm with them on sleep hygiene tips, making sure they're getting enough runway to get enough sleep. If we go to bed too late and you have a time you have to get up, you're not getting enough sleep, period. So we just the, like those basic those basic sort of sleep hygiene tips, figuring out whatever pattern is you need, um, were really, were, were helpful, I think, for our participants. So sleep, exercise, yes, to your point, meditation. Um, I think stress is gasoline on the fire of aging. I think it's incredibly potent. Uh, the clock that we used in our study, a full 25% of it is um, associated with glucocorticoid response elements. So in other words, it's it's changed by the cortisol response, by the stress response. I was response. just going to ask if there was evidence of cortisol's effect on epigenetics. And clearly, because we look back even for the um, transgenerational epigenetics and like Holocaust survivors, and that's where I'm like, oh, cortisol absolutely affects mm -hmm. expression. And you're saying the truth is the study. Yeah absolutely show that um, corticosteroids do affect it negatively if it's too high. Yes, I think so. I mean, I think so. We can see, I mean, 25% of it, there's no other variable that influences this particular clock as potently. So does that, it, it, I think that suggests mm -hmm. that stress is 
this extraordinarily huge, perhaps underappreciated variable. I, I mean, that's such a big deal. Yeah. And, and I, and she, and yeah, and talking about it's an interesting conversation around Holocaust survivors. We can see that in the in the World Trade Center, you know, offspring of World Trade Center. But these like these massive. I mean, that was a single event. Holocaust. The Holocaust was was longer, but you can you can definitely see these hair inherited stress patterns. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so meditation. So we prescribed a twice daily breathing exercise, just very simple called the relaxation response by a guy named Herbert Benson, who was at Harvard, you know, in the seventies studying meditation, but he wanted to, he wanted to take the woo woo out. So we called it the relaxation response, okay. <laughs> but it's a meditation. Yeah. 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 Especially in the seventies. Yeah. Um, we gave two supplements. We we did a, a probiotic, uh, Lactobacillus plantarum, and we chose that one specifically because there's some evidence that it can help produce uh, folate. So bacterial, microbiome-derived folate. Uh, it can help with that in the presence of adequate PABA, the B vitamin PABA. So we used Lactobacillus plantarum. And we did, by the way, Jill, increase circulating folate in our population uh, significantly wow. as compared to controls without any folate in sight, you know, just wow. food exactly. and the supplement. Yeah. And then we gave an additional greens powder. This is sort of evidence of me being very bullish on these important polyphenols. We gave them another dose. So even though the dietary pattern is about seven to nine cups of veggies a day, I mean, you're going to be eating a lot of veggies <laughs> during the eight weeks, make no mistake. We even, we layered some more in. So nice. Um, yeah. Oh, I love that because that's so critical. Now, so you've just kind of laid out and and this is all in your book, Younger You, but the, yeah. all the factors that really add to the positive outcome. What about the elephant in the room, environmental toxic load? I doubt that it was easy in eight weeks to study that, but I would just like to, you know, outside the study, your comments on what you see as how does environmental toxic load, molds, metals, um, parabens, phthalates, pesticides, all these things. Um, how is there any studies out there that show specific uh, aging pr propensity for these chemicals or things? Any thoughts on that? You know, I'm sure that there are. I mean, I want to say that there has been investigations looking at urban environment versus the suburban environment. In fact, I think that was a recent publication, urban versus suburban. So definitely the exposure to the the, the pollutants in the mm -hmm. urban environment. Um, certainly we know smoking is going to push biological age forward. We know without question that those toxicants disrupt gene expressions and specifically DNA methylation, but they get in and they mess with epigenetic expression. So via a variety of, of, mm -hmm. of mechanisms, I mean, there was a really disturbing study looking at um, exposure to DDT and other chemicals in generation zero mice and tracking the damage through generations in the, in the semen in the, of the, um, in the sperm of the, of the generations two, three, four, and it went multiple generations out. And actually the influence was worse over time. So it was like potentiated in this one study, but yeah, there's, there's just more and more evidence, um, you know, linking the damage of, of these environmental toxicants. In fact, um, Moshe Seth talks about it. Moshe Seth is a, is a, is a contributing, he was our, um, a mentor on our study. He's a really highly regarded epigeneticist of, at McGill university. Um, you know, and the, and the fact that it doesn't take a lot to influence gene expression. Like we're not looking at uh, EPA levels, right. you know, of single compounds of, you know, like huge occupational exposures when people worked in like, right. you know, felt factory smell, whatever, um, just multiple low dose synergistic exposures, just really wreaking havoc, you know, not may, not necessarily directly damaging the DNA, although that obviously happens, but really wreaking havoc with gene expression via D, um, DNA methylation. So yeah, I think there's plenty of evidence and, and yeah. papers coming out uh, all the time. And especially like in the field of cancer, we know these toxicants have a huge effect and that's all about methylation yeah. 
methylation, under methylation, and everything in between. And interestingly, I love that you mentioned that. So traditional toxicology, as you and I know, you know, has this nice curve and there's, here's the chemical level where 50% or greater of the population is affected. But as you and I are talking, when we've learned about the research of endocrine disruptors, this happens at a very hormetic effect, which is actually, so it's almost like two stages of the chem most chemicals where they can have a very, very low dose synergistic effect when combined that is more yeah. toxic sometimes and probably even I don't know that I can quote the study to prove this, but I'm guessing that these maybe synergistic hormetic low levels in combination are probably a lot more damaging to the DNA. I mean, I can, we can certainly say that they're influencing the course yeah. of all of the diseases. I mean, that's how we are exposed. I mean, we're right. able to control these massive exposures right. by, and I mean, although actually I will say, interestingly, I see more really high levels of mercury these days and people attempting to buy really clean fish. Yes. But not, yes. but not, I think, I think some of our classically clean wild caught fish are no longer so clean. So I am seeing yes. some higher burdens of certain toxins, especially mercury. Um, but I think in general, all of us are, are experiencing these, um, these basically this, this synergistic interaction of low mm -hmm. dose multiple yeah. compounds. And it's like, it's just, because we're it's, swimming it's, in it, right? Like it's, it's, yeah. you can't yeah, avoid yeah, yeah. it. One so, of the cool things, so let me just say this really heartening thing, and uh, is and that is that this diet is, by its nature, cleaning us up from those compounds. Yes. So it's dense with cruciferous veggies. It's dense with the compounds that can reverse some of the damage. I mean, we know, and I talk about it in the book, there's this really cool toxicologist at the University of Kentucky, um, Bernard Hennig. And I gotta, I, I hope I have him on my podcast one of these days. And he, he, his work is looking at how he, how you can offset the damage of these toxins through nutrition. And, you know, something comes, PCBs comes to mind. It was a study that he looked at. PCBs will drive the um, arachidonic acid eicosanoid cascade. So they'll turn up all of the enzymes involved in pushing forward one of the most aggressive forms of inflammation that, you know, that we really experience in our body. And you can turn that off if you're eating adequate, you know, omega-3 fatty acids, or, you know, if you're having some of the polyphenols that are really important. So a healthy diet all of the time Time is one of our most essential defenses. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you say that because once again, it's, I always say clean air, clean water, clean food, all these fancy supplements, these fancy programs, these fancy biohacking things are great, but you can do 80% of the work if you really, really focus on breathing clean air, drinking clean water and eating clean food. And that's kind of what you're saying as well. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah. And it is, I mean, it is, I know you could be so overwhelming, lot. right? Yeah. So let's yeah. laugh last few minutes here, two things mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about. One is just, there's a lot of tests coming out and now we can actually test our biological age. What's your thoughts Easily. on testing? Um, has it, it feels like it's exponentially increased in the companies that are doing it. And tell us just a little bit for the person who doesn't know anything about this. How do they actually, what, what do the tests do? And um, tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that. Yeah. I think they're, I mean, I'm very excited. It's a little bit, you know, it's a little crazy out there right now. There's a lot, a lot of right. companies, coming out, <laughs> a lot of biological age clocks, but you know, it's, it's really exciting and the winners will kind of rise to the top. You know, we'll, we'll see the, the tests that are the best. So they're measuring again, epigenetic expression, specifically patterns of DNA methylation um, that are associated with biological aging in some shape or form. Um, you know, there's clocks that are perhaps looking more at uh, physical fitness and biological aging, like they're measuring different yeah. aspects of, of physiology and, and, and function. Um, the clock that we used was a first generation clock. So they're now into the third, maybe uh -huh. even fourth generation of clocks. We used the Steve Horvath, the Horvath uh, yeah. original multi-tissue clock which I think is still a good solid clock. Like it's, 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 it, it functions in any specimen. So we used saliva. Yeah. Um, we didn't know back then that, that there were going to be other clocks. We didn't know the biological age. I know we didn't know this would take off. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we used saliva and that was the, the only clock that was reliable for us at the time. And I still think it's a good solid workhorse clock sort of measuring general pattern of biological age, you know, and able to be yeah. um, used in any tissue. Um, I like the pace of aging, uh, clock. I, I think that there's some good science. So what I would say to people listening is, you know, whatever lab that you go to, 
I think we want we want to work with a company whose clock has been published in the literature. They're using it in research. Ideally, the clock, the components of the clock, the CPG sites, the methylation sites that are measured are known um, so that other labs can try it and just, you know, see the reliability of it and that we know how they sort of trained the clock. So we know how they developed the clock. I think those things are important. The more open people are with that knowledge, I think the better. I'm a little bit concerned, although I, I think still think there are some good quality clocks that are proprietary. I actually do. I really do. But I would, I just, I err on the side of keeping science open. Uh, and so we we're using um, we're currently using the pace of aging for our research. I mean, it's a it's a pretty affordable um, tool. And, you know, it's 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 got a bunch of studies behind it. Amazing. And have you I'm assuming you've had your biological age tested? Yeah, yeah, for <laughs> sure. You were happy with the outcome. <laughs> have you yeah, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I too. am happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and again, it depends, you know, it's it's I mean, my in my pace of aging. So the the due to pace of aging, if you're aging at a rate of one, you're consistent right. with your chronological age. If you're greater than one, you're over. And then if you're under, that's better. So my pace due to pace of aging, I think is is I, I would I have to look at it. It's it's been a while, but it's like 0.7 ish or it's greater than points, but maybe between 0.7 and eight, I think. Beautiful. I think um, I'm right there with you on that. I was like, yay, I'm doing the right yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you know, it does. I mean, I would anticipate that, you know, well, no, I wouldn't anticipate. I know that it does change with exposures. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's probably a real, it, it's probably a good idea for us those of us who are healthy to do it annually, you know, and make sure we're reasonably dialed in doing the pace of aging, we can still get the Horvath yeah. um, and some other, you know, we can get other clocks. Um, but yeah, I would just, well, I, I, I think it's a useful tool to do. I do too. And again, more information in your book, um, Younger You. But one comment I'd love to make is that, I mean, I had cancer at 25, massive chemotherapy, massive right. toxic exposure. So I was right. like, really, I mean, I've done a lot of work, right? And That's do a lot right. of things. Right? Uh, I want to yeah, say that have. out loud because I, even though my biological age is a little bit you know, uh, better than the average, potentially, I feel like it gives hope to those who are in crisis, maybe have had mold exposure, maybe have had cancer like myself, because if I can do it, the average person, and I've had a lot of hits to my genome <laughs> and to my epigenetic yeah. expression. And I thought that was really encouraging because I would expect with all that my body has been through in my life and all the chemicals and all the chemo and everything that it might not be that way. And it's, it's in a good place, which is encouraging. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, for and I'm sure you've seen that too, because I feel like there is power even after 30, 40, 50, as we make those changes, a lot of the stuff really can transform our health, right? Oh, hundred percent. In fact, there's there's cool research on exercise that I love to put out there that shows we do better epigenetically the older we are. Yeah. So there's really yeah. no time. You know, like the present. Right, there's no to age. Start. It's too late to start. Okay, <laughs> yeah. last bit before we ask or let people know where they can find you is there are so many things on the horizon like peptides and like uh, biohacking, um, vagal nerve stimulators. I could just name a hundred different things. What would be one or two things that you see as potential, um, maybe bigger, uh, you know, versus diet that could be on the potential horizon for epigenetic aging? I think that probably, you know, some of the, probably rapamycin is mm -hmm. going to, um, you know, it, I think the research in animals is pretty solid on rapamycin being beneficial and, you know, in a lower, a lower dose than we use in, in transplant patients. Um, what else? So I think that's just nearing prime time for us. It'll be interesting to see with near near Basili, his work on 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 metformin and what the you know what that says and who's appropriate. We know that metformin is 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 a is is damaging to mitochondrial health in some of us, but then for some of us, it may actually extend life. I mean, it, there's definitely there's a there is a population for whom metformin is probably bio age reversal uh, reversing, and we just need to kind of tease that out. There are, I mean, I guess the biggest. A, a, a friend and colleague of mine, Sergey Young, talks about the longevity bridge. So right now we know it's, you know, all of the things that we advocate in functional medicine. Probably there's a place for stem cells, um, exposomes, you know, some of the, we know, actually, we know plasma exchange is probably important. So these are some radical 
mm-hmm. expensive, but right. interventions that we can do, we could do right now um, that are gaining some, inf- you know, some, some evidence behind them, but the diet and lifestyle, clean living, everything that we advocate foundational, essential, absolutely. Some of these other ones, rapamycin, et cetera, but we are, reversing biological age aggressively in cell models and tissue models and animal models, like pretty extraordinarily, you know, over in Altos lab, I, 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 um, Vittorio Sebastiano is a Stanford scientist who's actually nearing FDA approval for a phase one study in humans using, um, Yamanaka factors, these transcription factors that will significantly change epigenetics towards a younger, more youthful pattern, um, it does look, I think, I, I do believe that um, probably root cause or foundational, the foundational aging phenomena is happening in the epigenome. And so putting our attention there, or at least a chunk of our attention, I think when we address all of the various hallmarks, inflammation, you know, mitochondrial health, cellular senescence, et cetera, all of them are essential, the microbiome. Um but it does seem like the business end of the aging phenomena is right there in epigenetics. So I, I, th- I think that we need to be putting attention there. Um, but they're doing some pretty wild stuff in animal models and cell models and, you know, 10, 20 years time. I mean, we will be, we'll be playing around with aging in a, you know, in a way that Right. When we started our journeys, we never thought possible. Right. It was totally right. science fiction, but we are sitting on the precipice of some pretty extraordinary changes, I think. Well, we'll stay tuned. And I'm sure what's great about you is you always put out great articles, blogs, podcasts. Where can people find, if they want to stay tuned with this, where can they get your book? Where can they find you? Yeah. So Younger You is available wherever books are sold. Um, it's that bright yellow one over there. Yeah. Um let me see. DrKaraFitzgerald.com is my website. I have a podcast. Also, you can find that on any any place where podcasts are. Um, yeah, we've got blogs, we've got newsletters, all sorts of stuff coming out. And um, yeah, you know, we're thinking about these having we're having these more these kind of cutting edge conversations on um, on my podcast more and more. I'm just really excited about them. So if you want to kind of go on this journey with me, that that would be the the place to go. Yeah. Shout out to her podcast because you really do bring great uh, people on, great experts. Thanks. And the level of uh, science is phenomenal. So keep up the great yeah. work, Dr. Kara. Oh, and you. you know what? Let me just say, let me say one more thing. I'm, we have groups. So people who want to join us and do the program with us and contribute to the research, you know, again, drkarafitzgerald.com. Perfect. Awesome. And anywhere you're listening, you can find this in the show notes. Dr. Kara, thank you for all the work you've done over the years. Thank you for coming on today. We've really appreciated it. Yeah, it was great to see you, Jill.